Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. I hope you can hear me. Um, and giving me the opportunity to uh, give this talk regarding antibiotics in the ICU. As you might, some of you notice that I've changed uh, the uh, title a little bit to uh, antibiotics in the ICU, when, what and how. I don't think that I will cover the uh, essentials of what's also given the original title with this. Uh, yes, my name is Frederick Schauval. I work as mainly as an ICU consultant here in uh, Malmö and uh, I have a special interest in uh, antibiotics given in the ICU. And that is also with a focus that I think we are somehow over-treating our patients with antibiotics uh, at the moment, uh, and that there is uh, rather a uh, room for improvement uh, with that. Uh, also that um, I think this, this uh, overuse is somewhat driven by a fear that we don't, will not provide enough good care for our patients, um, and um, that uh, in a way, this is not a problem if we give some extra immunoglucosides, if we give a couple of extra days of antibiotics. But in my opinion, I don't think that is really a good way of doing it. And I also think that it, giving antibiotics doesn't come with some kind of collateral damage uh, to the patient. So we should give it, but we should give it also in the appropriate way. So this is all my conflicts of interest. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you to the concept of uh, optimal uh, antibiotic therapy. Um, it's not my own invention. It's, um, it's come up from uh, Jordi Rello and company a couple, like 10 years ago. Um, where the basic concept of us giving antibiotics is that uh, uh, we find a bacteria that is sensible in vitro and that is what we then say appropriate therapy and uh, many of us say okay think that we are home safe with that that is you know what what we should do and then we giving a correct treatment to our patients and uh, there are a little bit more to that and and than that and that is uh, moving up this ladder we you can say or step up to what is called adequate therapy uh, where we take into consideration a lot of the pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic variables for timing uh, and uh, giving the right dose and uh, also taking into consideration penetration of the antibiotics, etc. Uh, moving up then even further uh, to on this ladder is where we reach the optimal therapy. Uh, where we also take into consideration other effects than the antibacterial effects of the, uh, uh, of the antibiotic, such as immunomodulatory effects, uh, etc. Um, so there are a lot of ways of how to come into this uh, optimal antibiotic therapy. I can't go through all of them today. Um, they can be a little bit related into the questions that I put forward in my title to uh, when, what, and, and, and how. Uh, so, and I, um, where the what's here, you can say it's like adequate coverage and adequate penetration, when is relating to when to start and when to stop, and then the different hows is to have to give it in the correct route, uh, dose, and, and uh, administration ways, etc. So I will uh, concentrate here on a little bit on the whens and also somewhat on the hows. Um, so when Many of you might think this is like a total no-brainer. It's just, you know, give it as soon as possible, and, you know, that's it. Um, while that might be a, a correct answer, I would just like to reflect a little bit upon it, where these evidence and what it comes from. The Surviving Sexist campaign has just reiterated their, their guidelines, and they're stating that you should give antibiotics within one hour of recognition of, of sepsis. Um, these are mainly based on the evidence on two retrospective uh, studies. It came out like uh, one from Kumar et al. from 2006, and another a little bit more recent from Ferrer et al. published here in 2014, uh, where the last one you can see a little bit here, where they dug into the um, surviving sepsis uh, campaign database. Uh, looking how if the delay of giving a patient antibiotics reflected upon the survival uh, outcome. So starting uh, with giving antibiotics within the first hour, you had a approximately a um, mortality of 25%, and then moving up with after more than six hours of delay to 32, 33-ish uh, percent. Um, the problem, of course, with these studies are that they are retrospective, so there are a lot of confounding factors here, even though they do statistics and we have, um, they 
try to rule out these confounding factors, but we really don't know the adequacy or the accuracy of the antibiotics given. They are not given here. Uh, we don't know if these delays are confounded with other delays in the treatment of the patients. Uh, we know that bundles help. Are they giving enough fluids at the right time? Are they given other uh, aspects of the uh, treatments at the right time? We really don't know it. So. The best evidence we have so far is, I wasn't want to show you, this, this uh, meta-analysis uh, came out uh, two years ago from Sterling et al, where they tried to put together what's, what's out there uh, in form of evidence. And uh, the two aforementioned studies are in, included in this, uh, in this study. Uh, not many studies out there. There's, I believe, six in one in the one and uh, seven in the other one. And what they did was to stratify between the paper coming into triage and there, which is a classical way of, of saying late or early uh, uh, start of treatment. So more or less than three hours from triage, or if you, when you recognize septic shock, one or uh, below uh, less than one hour or more than one hour from septic shock. Um, you can see that. The Kumar study, which is often very heavily cited, it's way out here, so it's a very an odd bird uh, out here. Um, and the Ferris study is here and here respectively. So even though they are like on the positive side, collecting all the data, um, it, it still doesn't really sh give you, or can, we can't really show that there is a benefit of giving the antibiotics very, very early or not. Should we care? Well, I don't know if we should care. It's just showing what's evidence out there. We would likely never have a randomized control study giving it before or after. I think we are too, too past that. But just for a future or more hypothetical reasoning, I would say that giving antibiotics, we know that we do have a, the bacteria, it's a lysis, that's what we want, but also then we have a big outswarm of different uh, toxins and uh, immunostimulating agents, and from animal models we can see that giving the antibiotics we see an increase in the inflammatory response and also therefore a more rapid decrease in the organ function or an increase in the uh, multiple organ function sy syndrome. Um, so in my opinion, sometime in the future when we are a little bit more uh, have framed this problem a little bit more narrow. Maybe there's a way that we should start some immunomodulary therapy, maybe it's a couple of liters of fluids before we uh, go into the antibiotics just to, to oppose this. But for now, we don't really know this. So moving on then to how much, um, where we have the um, correct administration and the uh, PKPD um, variants. Why is it that we can't really use uh, our normal uh, FAS, what we call it in, in Sweden, our normal booklet to look up what, what um, antibiotics or what doses should be given. Well, there are a lot of changes in our critical ill patients. There's the vascular leakage syndrome, which many of us, so we have a larger volume and distribution. We augment that even further by giving all our fluids to them. Everyone knows that we have a decrease in albumin for most of our patients, and that alters the binding of, of many of our drugs that we are giving. We have a hyperdynamic state with an increased cardiac output, thereby increasing our clearance. So that's on one side of the scale. On the other side of the scale, we do have the patients who are developing a multiple organ failure, and especially the renal failure, and thereby decreasing the clearance. So, and the patients are not very easy, so they move from one side to the other, and then back again often. So to illustrate what this is really, uh, how this affects our patients and, and uh, how it affects our dosing strategies, uh, I will use this uh, study that we just published, or it's in press, uh, where we've studied uh, uh, meropenem. Mer meropenem because it's, uh, well, we choose that because it was a largely used uh, uh, stuff when we where was, was working. Uh, it's a beta-lactam, so I would say that even though the doses are maybe not exact, you can have the principles for, I believe, all the beta-lactams. So here we sampled 50 patients with septic shock um, or over seven, seven periods seven, or during a dosing period um, and made a concentration curve for that. And then putting that into a model where we can simulate a bigger so-called Monte Carlo simulation where we come up to you know, how it would look like in a larger cohort. So um, this, 
then we modulate with different uh, aspects of creatinine clearance and then also different, different aspects of dosing. So there's this uh, intermittent infusion uh, if you give it over 30 minutes, prolonged infusion if you give it over three hours, or continuous infusion, which is then the same dose just giving for, for 24 hours. So to summarize the slide, you can say that we saw that for covering all uh, patients with all creatinine clearances uh, by giving intermittent infusion of meropenem, you have to move up to approximately four to six grams per day. Uh, for prolonged diffusion, you could decrease that a little bit to two to three grams per day. Uh, with continuous infusion, you can say that it was more stable giving two grams. Um, and for stating that what uh, we aim for uh, reaching these targets for 95, so that's the line here, so 95% of the patients. So that's it. So to put it more into a clinical context, also we, we simulated how this would look like if you have a difficult to treat uh, uh, bacteria. In this case, it was Acinetobacter baumeni, um, and also then modulating it. So what happens if we give it empirically? That is, you don't know it. You know that uh, you're in an environment that you have this uh, difficult to treat uh, bacteria. And uh, so how, how much do you have to give if you give it empirically? And then if you get the answer, how much do you have to give if you give it as a targeted therapy? And also here in with different cretin uh, doses. So the red arrow that I'm pointing out here is with the high creatinine, which is then 200. So where you can see that it requires really high, so eight grams uh, of meropenin was required um, for the uh, intermittent infusion, for the prolonged infusion, to really reach up for, for covering uh, all, all aspects of uh, acinetobacter baumeni. It could be reduced a little bit to six grams uh, if you use the prolonged infusion. Um, if you use the targeted, then of course you could go down a little bit, uh, logically, because you don't have to cover the really, really resistant bacteria. But there was still a quite high uh, dosing here for six grams, moving down to uh, in the prolonged and uh, continuous infusion, more towards uh, normal uh, dosing, what you say, around three and two and three grams. Um, so these were the really high. Um, the really high um, creatinine clearances. If you go down to more normal creatinine clearances uh, of, of 100, all of a sudden you see a dramatic decrease in how much you, you uh, have to use. So uh, for the uh, intermittent, uh, for the empirical therapy, you can manage with three grams. And for the um, um, targeted therapy, you can actually move down to as low as, as one gram if you use the continuous infusion. So what does all this mean? This is like kind of a busy slide. Well, it means that if you're in doubt uh, of multi-resistant uh, uh, multi organisms, uh, and you're also in doubt if you have a patient which is a kind of a high real clearance, then you should use fairly large amounts of, of antibiotics. If you, though, have a nice resistance patterns in your community and there is no risk and you also have a patient who is on the, a little bit on the decline in his uh, renal function, well, then you can li uh, likely go for the more normal and standard dosing. So 200 in renal clearance, it's kind of high, many of you think. Uh, is this really relevant at all? I um, want to show that this um, study then, which is done in Australia, where they looked at this. So this is uh, around um, two, almost 280, almost 300 uh, critical ill patients where they wanted to look at this augmented renal clearance as they, as they uh, uh, define it um, and how, uh, how often you find these patients. Um, and in this cohort, they found that around 65% uh, were actually having, and this was defined then as uh, a clearance above 130 um, per square meter. Um, so they are not that very rare, actually, and they are around. And so who were they? Well, they were younger males with a normal creatinine. So uh, that's, uh, that are the uh, patients that you should be aware of. 
So what about obesity? Many of you have there's been a lot of talk now with regards to uh, creatinine clearance. Uh, many of you have obese patients. They are increasing, and there is a notion that well, we have to you know we have to supply them with some some more uh, antibiotics or whatever stuff you are giving them actually. Uh, this is another study also from Australia. Many of those studies are from Australia. Um, looking at into obese, so here they are uh, normal up to a BMI of 30, obese uh, with BMI of 30 to 40, and then morbid obese patients uh, who are having a BMI more than 40. And um, what they found was that the increased the volume of distribution being big. But they actually didn't, they made more or less the same uh, simulations that I showed you before. And it doesn't really show any effects of those uh, other. So the volume and distribution. And then you may ask yourself, of course, what's the volume and distribution and how does that affect me? Well, it means that you have to give a loading dose. So it, and showing here the loading dose is not just like for the obese it's actually for everyone especially if you go for more of a continuous or prolonged infusions because there if you're giving small doses all the time it takes a very long time before you go move up into an effective concentration but by giving the loading dose you come up there all the time and if there is one thing you should remember from going here is that the loading dose is not affected by renal function there's a lot of people who think, oh, he said, you know, we should diminish and we should go down on the dose. But the first dose doesn't matter. The, it's just like, then you have your volume of distribution, you have to fill it up. Then if it leaks out or the metabolism is slow, fine, you have to prolong it. But the first dose should always be a big dose. So again, does it help? All of a sudden I show you a Swedish reference. I thought it was Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian meeting, so... If you want to learn some Swedish, you can look that up. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice um, uh, paper uh, going through the evidence. If all this helps, like optimizing all this with the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic variables, so far you can say that no. Uh, it's, we don't know if it helps. There are not really any hard evidence out there that it uh, really does any help. Um, so there are, of course, someone who has said something else. Again, the Australians have looked into a, did a meta-analysis, like individual meta-analysis, they call it, uh, with regards to a couple of their studies that they've performed. And uh, where they find, just on the right side uh, of the, uh, the rhombus there, uh, that actually uh, continuous infusion is working. So therefore, they, from this one, they are now trying to launch, they or are launching the so-called Bling 3 study, which is going to be a huge study of including 7,000 patients, where they're going to look at meropenem and um, piperacillin and tesobactam for continuous infusion or intermittent infusion. Um, so we might get an answer for that within a couple of, within a couple of years. Uh, therapeutic drug monitoring um, is the next step. I will see how many of you here um, are performing, can measure uh, beta lactams in everyday practice on your labs. Please raise a hand. Not many. How many do it for uh, aminoglycosides? Many more. And how many do it for VANC? Yes. So you can see, so it's still, so that these are the, the last one, two are the, like the, the, uh, the ones who are uh, classically measured, but I think we are moving more toward that. We have these prolonged infusions and we have all these pharmacodynamic variables that we're trying to optimize, but, and, and then, but we're still guessing what the patient is, is receiving. So why not try to, to measure and, and see what uh, uh, then, and adjust according to that. And I think this is something that is, that is coming. Do we need an RCT? I've written down there as a hypothetical. Yes, we'll likely need it, because if we start doing something, it's usually better that we know a little bit more what we are doing than just jumping onto the train. So to conclude, um, start antibiotics early. Uh, we will never ha likely never have any definitive evidence for this. Um, start with a loading dose. If you're in doubt, if you're in an environment with a lot of multi-resistant organisms, you have a young, hunky male in front of you who's not gone into renal failure yet, think about that this patient will likely uh, need a higher dose to achieve sufficient concentrations. 
Um, if you can, monitor what you are doing, measure and adjust according to that. And I haven't had the time to go through uh, the when and then stop, but I would just say that stopping time, think about it, an extra dose or an extra day of antibiotics li will likely not do your patient any good, rather the contrary. Thank you so much.